So this is the 24th day of probability. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit more about Markov's inequality and Chebyshev's inequality. Talk a little bit about why Chebyshev is so much better than Markov. And this is going to be motivation for leading on to the central limit theorem, where the more we assume, not surprisingly, the better we can do. So Markov was the following. We had a non-negative random variable. The expected value of x was finite. And then the probability that x was greater than or equal to a was at most the expected value of x over a. So as a gets larger and larger and larger, this is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You might actually want to write a as maybe l times the expected value of x because that's the natural scale to look at for this problem. It's the only thing I've told you. What values of A will Markov's inequality be useless? When is Markov's inequality useless? Yes? If A is less than the expected value of X. Less than or equal to it. So if A is less than or equal to the expected value of X, you have the probabilities at most 100% that something happens. You can actually derive that a lot faster than using Markov's inequality. Right. It only becomes useful once A starts getting larger. Then we have Chebyshev. And for Chebyshev, we have X such that the expected value of X equals mu is finite, and the variance of X equals sigma squared is finite. And then we get the probability that x minus mu is greater than or equal to k sigma is at most 1 over k squared. What I like about this is this is looking at the right way to study fluctuations. I expect x to be of size mu because that's the mean. That's the average value. What do I expect the scale of the fluctuations to be? I expect it to be on the order of the standard deviation. That's the right units to look at. Anybody know roughly how tall the average American is? Either one, you can choose. Yes? Okay, it's, it's five inches different on average? Okay, so let's say the average then American is, let's say five, seven, somewhere in between. Okay? When you want to talk about fluctuations about the average, do you talk about, you know, the average American is about five, feet 7 plus or minus um, 14 inches squared. No, not if we're talking about height, right? You would never use inches squared. That's the wrong unit. You don't use the variance. You use the square root of the variance. You use the standard deviation. That's why this is the right way to look at things. This is a great quantity to look at. We're looking at fluctuations about the mean in terms of multiples of the standard deviation. For what value of k is this useless? So when would this be useless in terms of k? I'm sorry? Um, yes. Um, so we, we are going to assume k is positive. Yes, yeah, so if you want to ask, what's the probability you are at least half a standard deviation away from the mean? This gives you no information. So in fact, one possibility is here's mu, here's mu plus sigma, here's mu minus sigma, and maybe I have 50% of my probability at each one. And then my variance is going to be sigma, my mean is going to be mu, and if I take k to be anything less than 1, the probability will be 0. If I take k less than 1, then the right-hand side is over 100%. Okay? So as k gets larger and larger and larger, the result gets better and better and better. And you see things that are decaying like 1 over k squared. When we get to the central limit theorem, we will get even faster decay than 1 over k squared. And that's one of the powers. And we'll talk a little bit about why these two are so different in terms of the results they give. It's really because Chebyshev is assuming a lot more than Markov. Markov is assuming a non-negative random variable with just finite mean. Here we're also assuming something about the variance. There are two proofs. So one proof we just mentioned apply 
Makov to y equals x minus mu over sigma. And that will have a finite mean. All right. I'm going to go through the brute force proof. It's essentially the same proof as Markov, and it allows me to just reprove Markov and emphasize the idea again. So proof two. So the probability that x minus mu, I'm going to write it like this. x minus mu over sigma is greater than or equal to k is going to be the integral over all x such that x minus mu over sigma is greater than or equal to k of fx of x dx. By definition, I'm just integrating my density function over the correct region. This is the same as the integral uh, x minus mu over sigma of 1 fx of x dx. And now I'm going to replace 1 with something that's larger. And so I've got this condition x minus mu greater than or equal to k. So in this region, we have 1 is less than or equal to x minus mu over sigma, um, I guess with a 1 over k. Right? Am I doing this right? Yes? I want a k squared, though, not a 1 over k. What should I do? I'm sorry? Well, not quite multiplied by 1. I've got this inequality, but I want to have a 1 over k squared at the end, not a 1 over k. I could divide both sides of the inequality by k, but I want to somehow get the variance. Right? I know something about the variance. I've assumed that this finite variance. What quantity do I want to be integrating to get variance? Variance is x minus mu squared. Right? How could I get an x minus mu squared? What can I do? <coughs> Bless you. Yes, square both sides. If I square both sides, now I'm going to have an x minus mu squared, which is exactly what I want to get a variance. And so now I get that this will be less than or equal to the integral of x minus mu squared over k squared sigma squared <coughs> fx of x dx. And I did two things in this step. The first thing I did is I replaced 1 by x minus mu squared over k squared sigma squared. And then after I did that, I expanded the integration to all of minus infinity infinity. In the region that I care about, this inequality is true. This inequality is not true if x minus mu over sigma is less than k. But I can't be adding a negative probability. And since this whole quantity is non-negative, I only make the integral larger if I then expand the region of integration. So I'm doing two steps. I'm first replacing you know, 1 squared with this, and then I'm extending the range of integration. Well, now I can pull out the k squared, sigma squared, and then by definition, that's just the variance, which is sigma squared. So there's the 1 over k squared. If you look at how we proved Markov, it's almost the same proof. Okay. All right. Any questions on the proof of Shebyshev? So there's no need to go back and reprove and prove Shebyshev from scratch. We could get it directly from Markov. All right. What I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about why some methods do better than others. And because I've already given this lecture in operations research, um, I'll make it a little bit different, and I'll have a little movie clip at the end. So there'll be, I think, 30 seconds that'll be different. The other reason is 
There are very few prerequisites for a lot of courses at Williams. This is deliberate so that you have the opportunity to explore. But it often makes it a little bit painful because you want to know certain material, you want to use certain material. And so you sometimes see the same material in multiple classes. It's not necessarily a bad thing. You hear different perspectives and different takes on it. How many of you have seen Divide and Conquer? Oh, wow, okay. So then it's, this is definitely what's seen. So Divide and Conquer versus Newton's method. Who do you, which method do you think is better? If you've seen this before, you're not allowed to speak today. You can go to sleep if you want, though. So, which do you think is better, divide and conquer or Newton's method? Yes? Uh, divide and conquer. Why, dividing, why do you think divide and conquer is better than Newton's method? It seems if you split up the problem, you deal with the So, you split up the problem, but I haven't told you really what Newton's method is in divide and conquer. All you know is one of the greatest mathematicians of all time has the name attached to this method. We don't put Newton's name on small things. So divide and conquer, however, is better for some things. Divide and conquer works in more cases than Newton's method. So in that sense, divide and conquer is better. But when both are applicable, Newton's method does significantly better. And the reason it does significantly better is because it uses more about the system. So the goal is to solve f of x equals 0, is we want to find a root of something. So later today, let's say we want to find you know, f of x equals the square root of 3. We'll do this later. I'm just writing this down here. I'm going to erase it in 20 seconds. Um, maybe I'll look at the function g of x equals square root of 3. I'll then look at the function f of x is g of x minus, or look at this function, uh, x squared minus 3. And so if I try to find where this function is 0, that's the same as solving for square root of 3. So I guess I should probably be writing this as you know, x squared equals 3. I want to solve x squared equals 3. I want to solve for x. I can rewrite this as the function x squared minus 3 and then find where this is 0. So there's a lot of ways of writing the algebra. Finding where something is 0 is equivalent to finding where a simple translation of that function takes on a specific value you care about. So here's the way divide and conquer works. We want to solve f of x equals 0. We assume f is continuous. Without loss of generality, let's assume we're looking at the interval 0, 1, and we know the function is positive here and negative here. So if the function is positive here and negative here, what do we know about the function? Yes? It has a zero. Why? Because it's continuous. What's the, either the theorem or the letters I need to hear? There's a theorem, yes. The intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem says all values are attained if your function is continuous. You cannot just transport from one to another. If I start off you know, 10 miles from home and I end 20 miles from home, at some point I must have been 16 miles from home. Okay? So let's look at the halfway point. Let's assume the function is positive. What do you now know? Yes. What about from the interval 0 to 1 half? Is it non-zero in that interval? We don't know. The function could have multiple zeros, but we know there must be at least one zero between one half and one. So now let's look at three quarters. Let's assume it's negative here. Then we know there has to be a zero between one half and three fourths. So the way divide and conquer works is every time you have the size of the interval where your zero lives. You might be lucky, and it might actually be one of your points. You know, maybe the function actually vanishes at you know, five eighths. So you'll either get the zero or you'll have your uncertainty. So worst case scenario, you have your uncertainty. So let's do 10 iterations. So if we do divide and conquer 10 times, 
What happens to our uncertainty? How does it scale? What's the factor? So if the original interval of our uncertainty was of size 1, if we do it 10 times, what's the length of the interval where our root lies? 1 over, one over 2 to the 10th, which is approximately 1 over 10 cubed. So you gain three digits every 10 times. So if I want square root of 3 to, say, 12 digits, but how many times will I have to do divide and conquer? But how many? About 40 times. So that's a lot of work, but it's not horrible. And again, all I need to be doing is I'm just plugging in values and I'm just seeing, is it a positive number or is it a negative number? What I want to do now is I want to show you Newton's method. And again, think of this as a way of showing you the difference between Markov and Chebyshev and later between Chebyshev and the central limit theorem. The more you assume, the more you can do if you can find a way to exploit it. So now we're going to solve f of x equals 0. Assume f prime is continuous. So not only am I assuming my function is continuous, I'm assuming it's continuously differentiable. Not all functions are continuously differentiable. But not surprisingly, if we make this assumption, we should be able to do a lot more. So let's assume it looks something like this. And this is the zero we want to find. And we'll do a specific example. We'll do f of x is x squared minus 3. So the root is the square root of 3. Okay? Somebody want to give me a bad but not horrible guess for the square root of 3 that will be easy to work with? No, no, no. That, 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 that's, be, be kind to me. I don't want to work with 1.7. Yes? No, I don't want to work. Be kind to me. You, two. Which do you think I should guess with, 1 or 2? Well, the square root of 3, is that closer to 1 or to 2? It's closer to 2. Let's start off with 2. It's a dice integer. It's not a great guess to the square root of 3. It's not horrible. So we're going to start off with the point, with the guess x naught equals 2. So that's our first point. And the way Newton's method works is the following. You come up here, and then what we do is we draw the tangent line to the function. So one of the big themes of calculus, and this is one of the reasons why I want to do this, is it's a way to review what you've done in calc. The, one of the big ideas in calculus is functions are complicated. If you can replace a complicated function with a simpler function, you can often do more. You can often analyze. We did this the first day or the second day of class with the birthday problem. You know, we had the log of 1 minus x, and we replaced that with negative x. We're going to replace this with a straight line. And then what we can do is we can see where does the straight line hit the x-axis. And that will be a really good approximation to our root. And then we do the shampoo method. Lather, rinse, repeat. Right? You just keep doing it again and again and again. Do shampoo bottles actually tell you how many times you should lather, rinse, and repeat? Does it say do it three times or... It says twice. <laughs> so the more times we do it, the more accurate it will be. For a lot of things, doing it two or three times is already good enough. All right, I will try to see later on if the uh, microphone was able to pick that up. I probably will not be able to because it's all over here. Um, so now we come up over here. We play the same game. We draw the tangent line here. And, you know, again, you're almost proof by picture this looks really good. So what's going on in general is, let's say we're at some point xn. This point here is xn, f of xn. The slope is f prime of xn. And so we get the tangent line 
is going to be y minus f of xn equals f prime of xn x minus xn. So this will be the tangent to the curve at the point xn f of xn. If we want to find where it intersects, intersects at y equals 0, call this xn plus 1. So this gives you um, negative f of xn is f prime of xn, xn plus 1 minus xn. If you do some algebra, you get xn plus 1 is 1 half xn plus 3 over xn. So I'll, I'll let you do the algebra. You don't want to see me do algebra on the board. Okay? The hope is that this will converge to the square root of 3. Let's see what would happen if we actually took square root of 3 as our starting point. So if you know, one of these points is square root of 3, you get square root of 3 plus 3 over square root of 3. What's 3 over square root of 3? Square root of 3. So we have 2 square root of 3 divided by 2 is square root of 3. So if we start at the square root of 3, we end up at square root of 3. It's, this is called a fixed point. Its value is not changed when you apply the function. The hope is that as we take more and more points, as we iterate further and further down, we will get closer and closer and closer. All right. Does anybody know what the square root of 3 is? Approximately. Okay, I heard 1.7. Any more digits than 1.7? I only know the first tag. I know it's 1.732, and then the rest is 0, 0.5, 0, 0.8, 0, 0.75, 5, 6, 8, 8, 7, 7, 1, 9, 3, 1, 7, 6, 6, I'll stop there. Let's take x0 equals 2. I'm not even going to bother with 2. I'll write x1. So if we take x0 equals 2, we have 2 plus 3 halves. Right? Which is 7 halves. So we get 7 fourths, which is 1.75. Now what's nice is, it's always going to be uh, dot, dot, dot. We're always going to get fractions. We're always going to get rational numbers for our approximations. So not only are we approximating square root of 3, we're approximating it with rational numbers. <coughs> Good or bad? I'd say that's pretty good. Now, divide and conquer. Every time we do divide and conquer 10 times, we gain three more digits. Let's do x2. So x2 turns out to be uh, 97 56 or 1.73214. Dot, dot, dot. Good or bad? Pretty good. We're now off by 0 0.00009 roughly. That's not that bad. Let's do another one. And again, the algebra is now very easy. I now just plug in 9756 here, and we see what comes out. We get 18,817 over 10,864. All right, the numbers are growing a little bit, but it's still a rational number. Anybody here a computer science major or a potential computer science major? We can work with rational numbers very easily. And so if we start expanding that, we now get 1.732058. One zero zero one. So again, if you look at how far we're off by, you know, we're doing extremely well. All right. I'm going to stop writing the numbers on the board, and I will just you know scroll up here. So here's the next one is I think 708 million over 408 million approximately, and when we go down, we get 1.732 
1.732.050807568877293527446. And if you look at what square root of 3 is to 25 digits, that's the same as the square root of 3 to 25 digits. So when I was an undergraduate, I was torn between you know, math and physics. I loved both. I majored in both. It was a set of three problems along these lines that I took in my real analysis class that really pushed me to mathematics. Just how incredibly fast this is at finding the answer. You know, we're getting 25 digits of accuracy in four iterations of Newton's method. Essentially what happens is every time you apply Newton's method, you double the number of digits. So divide and conquer to every 10 iterations is 3. It's nice and linear. Newton's method is beyond linear. Absolutely amazing that with four iterations, we already have uh, square root of three this well. And again, why are we doing so much better? Because we're using more. We're using the fact that our function is continuous and differentiable. Okay, so here is a uh, little movie. And so it's not going to show up on the screen. So, oops, oh, excuse me. There we go. Okay. So, what we can do is, if we have a function that's a quadratic, how many roots does a quadratic have? Two. How many roots does a cubic have? Three. This is the fundamental theorem of algebra. A polynomial of degree n has exactly n roots. Some of the roots may have multiplicity. You know, if I give you x uh, minus 1 squared equals 0, 1 is a double root. Okay? So what we could do is we can play the Newton's method game. It's a fun game. Unlike uh, the game I played in operations research, I don't always win this one. And so in the Newton's method game, let's color each root a different color. Here, I believe the colors are yellow, green, and some type of orange. And what we'll do is we will choose a starting seed in the, comp in the complex plane and color which root it goes to. So this is related to something like x cubed equals 1. Or maybe it's x cubed equals negative 1. I forget which one this is doing. And you color the starting point based on what root you're going to. So here, it's probably x cubed equals 1 because here, this would be the point 1, which should be one of the roots. Here's the point e to the 2 pi i over 3, and here's the point e to the 4 pi i over 3. So not surprisingly, if you start near 1, Newton's method will bring you to that point. If you start near e to the 2 pi i over 3, it'll bring you near there. What's fascinating is as you get near the boundaries of the regions, and very small changes in your initial position will change greatly uh, where you go to. So this is you know, zooming in now. And you have points that are almost next to each other that have wildly different behavior in terms of what happens. So a great question you can ask in this is, what kind of stability do you have? See, I mean, you've got to be looking up. I mean, this is different from you know, 377. This is the 30 seconds that are different, OK? So I, mean, I, I find these pictures amazing. There's a lot of great mathematics behind how you generate this, about how, um, oh, now it's interesting is to see which things it says I should be watching next. Um, ah, Charlie Sheen, who was asked to, uh, by some fans, to throw out the first pitch in the uh, World Series, but was denied. So, the, you know, the question is, how do you actually calculate things this well? Because extremely small differences very quickly lead to wildly different behavior. Okay. But I wanted you to just get a little bit of a sense. This is some of my favorite mathematics. It allows us to review you know, tangent line approximations. It allows us to review a little bit from Calc 1, Calc 2. It allows us to see how including more information about the problem allows us to do better. Right. Before we move to our next unit, uh, Stirling's formula. Any questions on divide and conquer Markov Chebyshev? Okay, so the problem with Markov and Chebyshev is they're only giving us bounds on the probability. I want to know what the probability of certain events is, not approximations, not upper bounds. Approximations, well, I'd love to know answers exactly, but getting something exact is hard. I'm willing to accept a good approximation. 
And this is where the central limit theorem comes into play. And it says in many situations, if you add a bunch of independent random variables, then that sum converges to being normally distributed. And so we're going to want to prove things related to the you know, sums of independent random variables. What do you think the easiest random variable to study that I'll allow you to study? Yes? Uh, the uniform. Which uniform? Uh, There's not the uniform. One. Okay, one possibility is the uniform from 0 to 1, which is continuous. What else? The binary just takes on the value 0, 1, or minus 1, 1. So it turns out the discrete one is a little bit easier to study than the uniform. You have basically, you're flipping a fair coin. I'm not going to allow you to use the Mobius coin, which always lands heads. There's no need to develop a mathematical theory to calculate how many heads do I expect if I flip a coin that always comes up heads n times. Okay? If I flip a coin that has probability p of heads, I would expect to have np heads after n tosses, and my variance is going to be n p 1 minus p. And then the question would be, what's the probability I'm in certain bands? We will be able to do this using the central limit theorem. What probability of p do you think we're going to want to take to make things easy? 0.5, 1 half, the, the fair coin. And one of the key ingredients, we're going to do the special case of just flipping a fair coin, and this is a special case of the central limit theorem. We're going to need to understand how the factorial function grows. What function do we have that's closely related to the factorial function? Yeah. The gamma function. So one way to understand how the factorial function grows is to say, well, it's special values of the gamma function. And then we can use some tools and techniques from real analysis or complex analysis to understand the growth of the gamma function. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do some poor bounds on the growth of n factorial. So approximately how is it? If you want to see a little bit more, there are more descriptions in the book that go into uh, different ways of getting better estimates. I want to do some quick, cheap estimates that are pretty close. I'll say what the actual answer is. And then I will give you some ways that aren't quite as good, but give you a rough sense with less work. So we're not trying to bound or estimate n factorial. So the first, the big result is Sterling's formula. And it says n factorial is approximately n to the n e to the minus n square root of 2 pi n. A better is n factorial is n to the n e to the minus n square root of 2 pi n 1 plus an error of size 1 over 12n, and then there's another term that's here, error of size blah over n squared. So basically, an infinite series expansion where each term has a higher power of n in the denominator than the previous. Okay. This is the big Stirling's formula. For a lot of practical purposes, it's enough to just look at the main term. You know, the next term is smaller. Now, if n is huge, this is still a large term. Think of n as 100. 100 over e to the 100th power is enormous. And if I divide by 1,200, it's still enormous. But it's much, much smaller than the main term. You know, it'll be 1 over uh, 1,200, the size of the main term. So even though it's large on an absolute scale, it's small relative to the main term. OK? So that's why, for many practical purposes, we only really care about the first piece. OK. What I want to do is I want to continue the review of material from calculus. How many of you remember the integral test? How many of you remember that you actually saw the integral test at one point in your life, even if you don't quite remember what it is? OK. There is a reason, I, I swear, there is a reason that your professors taught you this stuff. It can be useful. And I'm pretty sure that when I taught Calc 3, I used the integral test to do a poor version of Stirling's formula. What's nice is my Calc 3 lectures are videotaped. I can go back and I can check. But I don't think I have to. I'm, I'm so confident. And if somebody wants to, they can check the tapes. Right. 
What the integral test allows you to do is estimate the values of sums by converting them to integrals. I'm not going to go through the most careful, detailed analysis. If you want to, I'm happy to do that. It's in the book. I want to give you enough to give you a flavor of what's going on. So we assume f is monotonic. What that means is f is either increasing or decreasing, or better yet, non-decreasing or non-increasing. So f does not go flip-flop, flip-flop in terms of how its values are. So if I look at um, n factorial, this is n times n minus 1 all the way down to times 1. It's been a while, but what should you be thinking as soon as you see this for n factorial? You should be having a Pavlovian reaction. It's been a while, but what should you... So that's the definition of what n factorial is. Yes. Take the log. Take the log. You know, if you are tutoring at the elementary school in, say, second or third grade multiplication, don't take logs. Almost every other time in your life in a math class, if you see a product, you should be thinking about taking logs. We understand sums better than logs. So you would get the log of n factorial is equal to the log of n plus dot 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 plus the log of 1. Or the sum k goes from 1 to n of the log of k. So what this means is that we now have a nice sum for the log of n factorial. Well, if we can estimate the sum, we can then exponentiate. And this might give you some sense of where this e is coming from in the Stirling formula. So what we can do now is let's look. So here is 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, 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 n. And so this will be, uh, I don't know if I want to do this. So the log of 1 is 0. The log of 2, say over here, the log of 3 is a little bit larger. The log of 4 is a little bit larger. Log of n is a little bit larger. We can draw the log function basically going between these. Is the log rapidly increasing or slowly increasing? Slowly increasing. So maybe it looks you know, something like this. And I'll draw the last one down over here. If I want to get an upper bound for the, log, for the sum of the logs, I can just draw my rectangles like this. And this will give me an upper bound. If I want a lower bound, I draw my rectangles like this. Okay? So we can sandwich the sum of the logs between an integral of the function log x. Okay? You have to worry a little bit about the endpoints. Am I summing n terms, n minus 1 terms? I really don't want to worry about all that right now. I want to just give you the high-level idea. If you really want the details, go through, read the book carefully, talk to me. I just want to give you a sense. So roughly, the sum of log k, k goes from 1 to n, is approximately the integral from 1 to n of the log of t dt. You have to worry a little bit about the endpoints, but this is roughly what's going on. So we need a function whose derivative is log t. Uh, my favorite way to solve this is the method of divine inspiration. So who remembers how the method of divine inspiration works? You say this might be the right answer, and then you check to see if it's the right answer, and yep. it's the right answer. Yep. So I claim if I take uh, big F of t, to be t log t minus t. If I then take its derivative, big F prime of t, I use the product rule, I get 1 times log of t plus derivative of t, I'm sorry, plus t times the derivative of log of t, which is 1 over t minus 1, which is log of t. So the divine inspiration works. Okay. It's not a horrible thing to try. I want to get a log t. One way to try this rule is if I look at a t log t, when I take the derivative of this, 
uh, when the derivative hits the t, I'll get a log t, and then I'll get a plus 1. So then if I just tried t log t, my derivative would become log t plus 1. I now subtract something whose derivative is 1. Okay? So if I use this as my guess, I can approximate this integral, I can evaluate this integral, and I would get t log t minus t at 1 and n, 1 and n. So I get n log n minus 1 log 1. Well, what's log of 1? 0. And then I get n minus 1. I'm not going to worry about the 1. Okay, ah, I'll worry about the 1. Put the 1 in. So this is an approximation for the log of n factorial. So that means n factorial is about n to the n log n minus n plus, I'm sorry, this should be an e, plus 1. And that's going to be, well, log n is going to give us an n to the n, and then we'll have a e to the minus n, and then we have an e. It's not bad. You know, the correct answer should have a square root of 2 pi n here. If I did a little bit more work, I could get that. The real issue is how I'm approximating the n's. And when you do the integral test, there's something called the uh, euler mclaurin formula to do these sums and integral approximations. The error is approximately half the sum of the first and the last box. The last box is going to be giving me a log of n, so you get half of the log of n. Half of the log of n is, square root of, is the log of the square root of n. And so when you exponentiate, the exponential of the log of the square root of n is just square root of n. So if you do a little bit better job, you can actually get the square root of n. Okay. The point here is I want to give you a rough sense that Sterling's formula is correct. You know, this was a you know, two-minute example using the integral test from calculus. With more work, we could do better. Okay. What I want to do is I want to end the day with an elementary attack on Stirling's formula. And so however much time we have, that's how far we'll go. Elementary attack. So the factorial is an extremely important function. We need to know how it grows. So I'm always going to assume that um, n is maybe a high power of 2, just so I don't have to worry about how I cut things. So n factorial is equal to 1 times 2 times n. Can somebody give me a really bad bound for n factorial? Really bad, yes. n to the n, right? Bump everything up to n, great. Can somebody give me a really bad lower bound? 2 is too good of a bound. 1. All right, n factorial lives between 1 and n. Let's now split it up in half. Here's n halves n halves plus 1. And for those of you in operations research, you might actually remember this. You know, we did this for a certain sum. We can play the game here. Let's look at each of these subintervals and do the best bounds we can <coughs> that are easy to do. What's a really good upper bound for this interval? Yes. Not n factorial. And again, we don't know what factorial is, so we don't want to bound in terms of n factorial. Yeah. So this part here would be less than or equal to n to the n halves. We have n over 2 terms, and each term is at least n. I'm sorry, each term is at most n. What about a lower bound? It would be a decent lower bound. and halves to the what? Also to the n over 2. If we look at the first part over here, what's an upper bound for the first part? n over 2 to the n over 2, and the lower bound would be 1 
to the end over two. So I'm only going to look at upper bounds for now. You can do a similar argument for the lower bounds. So we get n factorial is less than or equal to n over 2 to the n halves times n to the n halves. That's going to be n to the n. And now we're going to have 1 half to the n over 2. So that's going to be 1 over square root of 2 to the uh, n. Right? Because I have a 2 and I have it n halves times. Well, a better way of writing that is this is n to the n, 2 square root of 2 to the negative n. We're supposed to get n to the n e to the minus n. If you need to calculate square root of 2, if you forget what that is, how could you calculate square root of 2? Newton's method, right. There was a reason why we did that earlier today. Right? It's about 1.414. So we get about n to the n, 1.414. The correct answer is n to the n, about 2.718. Not horrible. What could we do to do even better? I'm sorry? Do it again. We could break each one of these up into fourths. And so I go through this in excruciating detail in the book. Probably more detail than most of you want, but just skim it. And you can see that it's getting better and getting better and getting better. There's something else we can do. We can do a better job with the estimate here. We can use the Farmer-Brown problem from calculus. Have we talked about the Farmer-Brown problem in this class? I think this was an operation. So in Calc 1, or, or, or you find out that Farmer Brown has a cow, and this cow loves rectangular pens, and Farmer Brown will not consider any pen other than a rectangular pen. And so if you have a given amount of perimeter, what shape maximizes the area? What's the answer? It's a square. So it's a nice calculus problem. Prove that if you have a fixed perimeter, the square maximizes. What I can do is I can look at all these numbers in pairs. The sums are always the same. The best value is going to be right in the middle. Right? That product will be larger than everything else. So for each pair, so let's say I have, um, I'll do the original one. I have 1 and n. I have 2 and n minus 1. I have 3 and n minus 2. The sum is always n plus 1. The best is really just the middle. So just as a quick estimate, what I can do is I can say the best is n halves times n halves for the product. And how many peers do I have? I basically have n over 2 peers. OK? This will be my upper bound for n factorial. And you get n factorial is less than or equal to n to the n. And now you'll have 4, square root of 4 is 2, 2 to the minus n. Without even doing any division, any dyadic decomposition, we're now getting a 2 to the minus n, which is really close to the 2.718. Let's now try going back over here, and now let's use the farmer brown here and see what we can do for the upper bound. And then we'll call it a day. So over here, each one of these is going to basically be n over 4. So we'll have n over 4 times n over 4. And how many pairs do we have? We have n over 4 pairs. And then here, we'll have, I think, 3n over 4 times 3n over 4. And we'll have n over 4 pairs. And so we get n factorial is thus equal to n to the fourth, then to the n to the n fourths, will be an n to the n. And then we'll have uh, 9 over 64 to the n over 4. Well, if I take a square root, I would get 3 sixteenths. If I take another square root, it would be square root of 3 over 4. Right? And so I would get that this is n to the n, 4 over square root of 3 to the minus n. Fortunately, we calculated square root of 3 earlier today. It's less than 2. 
So this number is now going to be a little bit greater than 2. So you can see how quickly you're getting to e to the minus n. And you can, you know, lather, rinse, repeat, you can keep doing methods like this. It's really nice to see how far you can push these approaches. All right, this is a good place to stop. Have a good rest of the day.